Okay, so the last speaker of this session is uh, Simon Mitton, University of Mitton, sorry, Simon Mitton, University of Cambridge. Uh, he is going to tell us about the Big Bang versus steady states, with these rivals in cosmology. Please. Right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I am. Um, uh, I am not a professional historian. I've got a physics degree and I've been a science writer and had a long uh, career as a publisher, as a few people in this room are already aware because I've published you. So um, I, uh, I, I like to speak in terms of people, uh, their circumstances, where did they come from, what's their background, and then how did they, how did they interact with each other and what um, motivated them. So you will, you, you will see I will be talking about people um, rather than the specifics of their papers. Uh, and I've got four kinds of people. There's the three pathfinders, Einstein, Wilhelm de Sitter, and importantly, uh, Georges uh, Lemaitre. Um, we've got two observers who are absolutely crucial in this story uh, for data on realism about looking at objects in the universe and what they could find out. Uh, we've got the three musketeers, Gamow, Hoyle and Ryle, and I, I, I identify um, two jousting tournaments uh, which, they, which they have. You will notice that I do not have Gamow versus Ryle. Uh, that, is, that is because neither of them met each other and um, they, didn't, uh, they, didn't, they didn't correspond. Uh, some of this you've heard, all, you've heard already, so I'll be very quick. 1905, we have Einstein's, uh, Einstein's uh, four papers. The road to general relativity was, uh, was long, and, um, long and difficult. And so far as I can see, it wasn't until 1913 when Einstein uh, uh, learned and adopted Riemannian um, geometry and tensor calculus uh, that, that he began to make rapid progress. In July 1915, um, Einstein, uh, Einstein met up with uh, David Hilbert. Uh, Einstein knew that Hilbert was trying to find field equations as well. And uh, um, in the course of this meeting, uh, it seems that um, Hilbert, um, uh, Hilbert realized he needed to get on with his program, which was not identical to Einstein's. And that led to a sort of desperate race against time for Einstein, who was, who was, uh, who was worried that David Hilbert would get there first. So on the 25th of November, um, 1915, Einstein uh, read his paper on the gravitational field equations in Berlin. Now, in some of the popular accounts of this, um, you, will, you will read that Einstein was close to a nervous breakdown and so on and so forth. Um, he, was also, he was also dressed in formal evening dress, um, as they did in those days in workshops like this at the Prussian Academy. Five days after Einstein uh, had completed and submitted his paper, Hilbert published a note um, giving, uh, giving the field equations, but the big dif in terms of priorities, the big difference between the two is that, I is that Einstein gave his proof, whereas Hilbert did not. Now, there's many solutions to the uh, field equations, as everybody in this room is very familiar with that. Uh, Einstein, in 1917, uh, he is the first to apply the field equations to the entire universe. Now, in terms of what we've, what we've just been hearing about, uh, about Bohr and so on, um, this is, in some ways, rather, re rather remarkable that um, Einstein is now going to ap apply it to the whole universe. Of course, uh, the, he, he has to make assumptions about parameters, so uh, Einstein produces a model um, which, has no, which has no pressure, in other words, no radiation, but it does have matter. Uh, he didn't straight away consider its st stability. Um, it is a model which is unstable. Wilhelm de Stisser 
uh, he, he decided to look at a universe model which did not have any matter but did contain the, uh, the radiation. Um, and uh, his solution too had, um, had, had difficulties. In 1922, uh, Friedman in St. Petersburg, uh, he is the first one to publish dynamical solutions and he publishes them in Zeitschrift für Physik. Uh, he finds a, a, a solution in which the universe is allowed to expand and where it's allowed to contract. He makes uh, no connection whatsoever to astronomy. The main, um, the main impact, uh, immediate impact, which he had, is, uh, is that George Gamow, um, who was in St. Petersburg in 1922 and took Friedman's lectures, uh, this is when Gamow first becomes interested in, uh, gen in general relativity. The big step forward comes in 1927. Um, Georges George, uh, Lemaitre, um, had been working on, had been working on um, general relativity, self-taught, uh, from um, probably uh, 1919. And um, as part of Belgium's post-war recovery, uh, he was given a big travelling fellowship to spend one year at the University of Cambridge uh, working on general relativity with Eddington, followed by another year in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, working, for example, at Harvard College Observatory, where, where he came across observational astronomy and so on. By 1927, um, he, had, he had derived solutions for the time evolution of the radius of the cosmos. Uh, in, other, in other words, the, the expansion of the universe. Out of loyalty to his country, he was very much a Belgian nationalist. He decided to publish this in the, um, the uh, Proceedings of the Brussels Scientific Society, which is a journal that was, that was circulated to libraries and so on worldwide, but um, it had very little readership uh, out, outside, um, outside Belgium. Uh, so, Nothing happened for a while. Um, then in, uh, then in, 19, in 1930, um, he wrote to his former tutor, or his former mentor, um, uh, Eddington, and um, Eddington, um, uh, Eddington suddenly gives him a lot of support. Uh, Eddington described Lemaitre as being the most talented student um, he had ever had and he regretted immediately that he hadn't, he hadn't noticed the 1927 paper. It made such an impression on him that uh, he, got, uh, he got Lemaitre to London. Lemaitre spoke at the Royal Astronomical Society in uh, 1930, and this resulted in the publication of his paper in translation in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. The importance of that is the monthly notices um, had a global circulation um, through, the, through, the, uh, through the British Empire and so on and so forth. And so very, very quickly, um, Lemaitre's, um, Lemaitre's ideas uh, um, uh, catch on. Um, he did another very high profile uh, lecture talk in 1931 um, which was connected with the British Association for the Advancement of Science and so this is when a wider public um, uh, begins to uh, learn of, um, begins, begins to learn of Lemaitre's work. We were just, we were just hearing about Einstein's approach to realism and so on and so forth. And um, he, uh, uh, he um, was at the Solvay, at a Solvay conference. Um, this, was the 19, this was the 1927 one. Um, Lemaitre, of course, wasn't invited to things like the Solvay uh, conference, but Lemaitre managed to meet, to, meet up, to meet up with him in a coffee break, as it were and said that he liked the mathematical elegance of Lemaitre's work, um, but as a piece of physics, it was, um, it was abominable. 
Lemaitre did recover from, um, from all of that, and he, reco he recovered from it um, by promoting his uh, hypothesis in picturesque language as a fireworks universe um, in which um, everything has a singular origin and it explodes with enormous, uh, with enormous violence and so on and, and so on and so forth. The impact of this in terms of uh, quantum cosmology is um, Lemaitre is the, is the first one to find an application uh, for quantum physics uh, in, uh, in cosmology. Um, he won so he was, the he was the first quantum cosmologist. He applied the phenomena of radioactivity um, and the uncertainty principle to the origin of the universe. Now let's uh, do a bit of realism and um, uh, consider the people, two people, um, who found evidence for the recession of the galaxies. The first one is Vesto Slifer of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. He uses a 24-inch um, telescope with a spectroscope, and he starts to look at the spectra of spiral nebulae. There's a bit of a backstory here, which is helpful to know. The Lowell Observatory is named after Percival Lowell, who was a Bostonian Brahmin, a person with a great deal of, uh, of wealth. And he set up this observatory in Arizona and appointed an astronomer, um, went and observed there very occasionally himself. The purpose of the observatory was to search for life on Mars. And um, uh, Lowell himself um, published um, three books, the third of which is all about the economic and social system um, which, exists, which exists on Mars. So this is the, this is the person who was Vesto Slifer's boss. Why was Vesto Slifer looking at spiral nebulae? Because Lowell believed that the spiral nebulae were nearby planetary systems in formation, which was not an unreasonable hypothesis. Well, uh, when Slipher measured the redshift of the spectral lines in the Andromeda Nebula, um, he, reali he realized straight away um, that it must, lie, it must lie outside our own Milky Way system. <clears throat> he went on uh, with this program of measuring the um, spectra <clears throat> of spiral galaxies. He was in contact with the Lick Observatory, which was the other observatory in the US uh, where this work could have been done. And um, they had a 36-inch telescope, and they wrote, back, they wrote back to him and said, um, you'd, better, you'd, better, you'd better be correct in what you're saying, because we've been unable to reproduce it. Um, and basically, you're going to make yourself look a complete fool. Anyway, the complete fool uh, published data on 25 spiral galaxies, uh, got the gold medal of the French Academy of Science in 1919, and the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1932 for this work on m measuring the velocities of galaxies and showing that they were in recession. Um, Edwin Hubble, uh, he was looking at the Andromeda Nebula as well, but from a different point of view, and using Cepheid variable stars, he was able to establish its distance and find that it was far, far beyond the, um, the Milky Way. Uh, he and his um, colleague or assistant, Milton Hummerson, um, by the middle of the 1920s, they had measured the distances to 40-odd, um, Forty-odd uh, spiral galaxies. Um, it was in 1929 that uh, um, Hubble does the first of his velocity distance diagrams. Uh, these are these are linear plots in which uh, uh, the velocities, almost all of them, taken from Vesto Slipher, and quite a few that. Uh, Hubble used. He did not give any credit to Slipher for them. Um, so the velocities basically came from um, Slipher and the distances 
uh, came from uh, Hubble and Hummerson's um, measurements of plates taken with the 100-inch telescope <coughs> at Mount Wilson. <coughs> in the version of this diagram that was published in 1929, there were only about 14 or 15 points and only an optimist would have suggested that it was possible to put a straight line through them, which is what Hubble did. But then he went on and got this, uh, uh, this you know, more, ac more accurate one. Interestingly to me, um, Edwin Hubble never ever claimed or accepted that he had discovered the recession of galaxies. Um, he maintained right until the point at which he died in 1953 that there could be other explanations for the redshift phenomena um, apart from the recession of the galaxies. Now, when, when we get to the Hubble Space Telescope, there's an enormous publicity uh, operation um, going, on at, uh, going on at NASA um, and they put out a great deal of information, um, misleading information, uh, about how the telescope was named after the person who had discovered the expansion of the universe. Uh, in 1936, in the last sentence of um, Hubble's book um, on, the, um, on the nebulae, um, he says that uh, he dismisses as airy speculation um, much of what is being talked about and advises that this airy speculation um, uh, will, only will only cease when there is a lot more data. Already by 1936, um, Hubble and the people at Mount Wilson were hoping that there would be a larger telescope um, and vague discussions about what, what the 200 inch were already underway. Lemaitre's quantum cosmology, um, Lemaitre uh, um, publicizes this through, through uh, talks and so on, and um, um, came up again with this picturesque expression of uh, the universe having actually existed for all time but existing just as a primeval atom which contained all of the matter and all of the energy. Uh, and it suddenly started to decay radioactively um, because, of the, uh, because of the uncertainty principle. Um, and uh, um, he, um, I mean, he was, he was the first person to use what was known as the Hubble diagram to actually derive an age of the universe. Um, so uh, very, very, um, very interesting character. And uh, with the expansion of a very hot energetic universe, um, he realized that there should be something left over. And he thought that the cosmic rays might be the relic of the fireworks universe. And he's, um, he spent he spent the last 10 or 15 years of his life working in cosmic ray physics. Okay, now I come to the, now I come to the, to the three protagonists. George Gamow, a uh, theoretical physicist um, born in Odessa. Uh, he had an absolutely terrible time. Uh, he, um, uh, he lives through two revolutions uh, in, 19, in 1917. Um, and uh, then he has. The, then there is the rise of Stalin. Um, there's also the uh, there's also the um, the civil war in I think 1922, 1923, and he writes about that uh, in one place in an interesting context. He's preparing for the examinations at the end of his first year studying physics at Odessa University. And he says that four blocks away, he can hear the white army and the red army fighting from house to house, um, just sort of down the road. And, 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 he, and he, just, he just carried on, carried on working. In 1923, 
he leaves Odessa and he goes to St. Petersburg. His father sold the family silver to get the money to enable him to go to St. Petersburg. And there, his career in theoretical physics absolutely takes off. Um, he's influenced, as I said, by Alexander Friedman. He's also interacting with uh, several uh, young men who became very well known. Um, uh, for example, uh, Lev Landau. And um, uh, he, um, 1920, 1928, in order to improve his knowledge of the new physics, he went to, he went to Gottingen. Uh, he also got permission of the Soviet authorities to spend time in, uh, in Copenhagen with, um, uh, with, with Bohr's uh, Institute. This is where he made a discovery that, a court, that as the historian Helga Krag puts it, just, but only about just, should have won him a Nobel Prize. Uh, this was the quantum mechanical, quantum mechanical tunneling allowing a particle to penetrate a potential barrier to either get into a nucleus or get, or get out of the um, nucleus. Uh, we, know from, we know from Gamow's memoirs um, that this whole idea from conception to writing a paper and sending it off um, took, him, uh, took him less than... Uh, less than a week. He became increasingly um, dissatisfied with Soviet Russia. Um, Stalin, uh, Stalin um, uh, forbade the teaching of anything whatsoever to do with quantum mechanics um, in, the, in, the Russian, in the Russian universities in, in St. Petersburg. Um, this, of course, was because everything Soviet was predetermined. Uh, in 1933, the Solvay Conference, uh, um, Gamow participates in the 1933 conference, and he decides that he will uh, he will he will go to America um, and work there and not go back to Mother Russia. Um, right. Right. So, I'll now come, now now to the, I come I now come on to Fred Hoyle's early life, which is easier to deal with. Um, Bingley, West Yorkshire, lovely a lovely a lovely accent, which he did, which he employed to very great effect in the late nineteen forties and early fifties. With his um, with his radio broadcasts, and uh, um, his father uh, his father signed up World War One, enlisted machine gun corps, um, served four years, came back alive, survived the survived the Battle of the Somme, um, according to Fred, what his dad told him was he survived the Battle of the Somme um, because uh, it was very very misty moisty morning. Um, and he just told the five guys he was responsible for, um, don't fire anything, don't, don't, don't fire in the direction of, and, and, and they, 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 they survived because that's what they did. He went on to read, uh, to read mathematics at Cambridge. His, um, his first doctoral supervisor was Rudolf Piles, nuclear physicist, uh, who went off to Birmingham. Um, Hoyle then had Paul Dirac, uh, who was in the same college as him. Um, a lovely arrangement. Um, uh, Fred felt he didn't need any supervisor and Paul Dirac felt it was beneath him to supervise students. Um, so that relationship, that relationship worked very well indeed. And Fred was appointed a JRF at St. John's in 1939. Then his wartime work was research on uh, radar for the Admiralty and um, that's where he met Bondi and Gold, about whom I'll have more to say in a moment. In 1945, he returned to his teaching in Cambridge. Now, Martin Ryle is very different to either of these, um, a radio engineer and, a radio, and became a radio astronomer. Uh, he came from a really distinguished family that could trace their origins 
um, to being um, serious uh, estate owners, farmers, um, in the reign of Elizabeth, Elizabeth I. Uh, so um, his father was, became Regius Professor of Physic at Cambridge, Gilbert Ryle was his uncle, so on and so forth. Um, he, Ryle was educated at a fairly, ex, a fairly exclusive um, private school and went on to read physics at Oxford from 1936 to 39. September 1939, um, he joins the Cavendish uh, Laboratory in their, um, in, their radio, in their radio group. Uh, but after only eight months, uh, he was, he was um, signed up to go and work on radar countermeasures, um, particularly the design of antennae uh, by the, uh, by the uh, telecommunications research establishment. Um, and so um, his, war, his, his war service um, uh, was, all, was all done there. Um, he, had an, he had a really, really traumatic time. He had only been, he'd only been um, running his group at the age of 23 for a few months when, uh, when three or four of them who were testing equipment that Ryle had designed in a Halifax, in a Halifax bomber, um, the bomber crashed and killed everyone. And um, uh, Martin um, never ever completely, completely recovered um, from the trauma of this. Now, how to connect the war work with radar and cosmology? Um, uh, Hoyle was, was um, uh, Hoyle devised a method of measuring the altitude of an incoming fima, fighter attack plane from the from, to, to make measurements observe, observe from the ship. Um, and be able to get um, not only not only the direction, um, but but also the uh, be able to get the altitude and the distance. You needed both of those, of course, um, in order to take uh, to take protective measures. Um, Hoyle was, as it were, mentioned in mentioned in dispatches um, for the for the great effect of the pencil and paper method he devised. Um, which, which could be used in real time at sea. And at the weekends, as is very well known, um, he, Bondi and Gold discussed cosmology. Um, Ryle, um, his antenna designs and his designs of receivers and detectors was very important when he got back to Cambridge in 1945 because he was able to start straight away on, uh, on radio, well, radio astronomy and observing the sun. Uh, Gamow had an easy ride because he had been a major in the Soviet army teaching um, artillery, no, um, teaching meteorology, uh, he was denied security clearance. So when George Washington University was cleared out of all the nuclear physicists who went and worked on the Manhattan Project, um, he was basically left twiddling his thumbs and working on the formation of galaxies. Gamow had been interested in the origin of the chemical elements from the 1930s um, and uh, had published two or three astrophysics papers. The quantum mechanical tunnel effect, um, he, uh, he, he, he realized fairly quickly this would give you a method of building, uh, of building the elements by them absorbing protons, by absorbing protons, neutrons, whatever, um, and building up, uh, building up the periodic table. Uh, Gamow decided not to do any research on this. Um, he gave the ideas away to, uh, to, um, to others um, who, who went on to show that, to show that um, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you, could, you could get um, nuclear reactions going. Yes, right. The, 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 in a flash of inspiration, um, he proposed that, uh, that uh, Lemaitre's primeval atom um, could be where there would be the right 
conditions in terms of energy and heat, in terms of energy, uh, for getting neutrons uh, to be absorbed by um, the nucleus. And uh, he, pr he, he promotes this from 1942. Uh, it, the idea was made to work by his doctoral student, um, Ralph Alpha, who first of all demonstrated that a cold Big Bang didn't enable you to achieve very much um, because everything was over very quickly and there simply wasn't enough energy content. Alpha then began working on his own um, on a hot Big Bang model uh, in which um, the neutrons uh, in the early universe would have um, sufficient, sufficient energy uh, to be able to, um, to uh, penetrate the nucleus. And for good measure, he, um, uh, he uh, calculated the present day temperatures as um, five degrees K. Gamow was never interested in the slightest in this. Um, and uh, in later years, he tried to get um, Alpha to drop it. Crucial test of Alpha's model was, did it reproduce the actual observed reality um, of the abundances of the elements? And this diagram um, is taken directly from the thesis uh, itself. Um, as far as I can make out, no, 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 nobody has ever showcased the actual diagram in the, um, in the thesis uh, before. So you're, you're, the, you're the first. Um, the, the, uh, you can see the jagged line going up and down. Those are, those are Goldschmidt's uh, um, natural abundances and all the other stuff in the diagram is alpha, uh, is alpha showing on an overly complicated diagram how all of this could work. And he established, um, uh, uh, he, he established cosmology as a real branch of physics. Unfortunately for him, uh, Gamow grabs all of the publicity. Um, the, the initial paper, uh, Gamow says the authors are Alpha, Beta and Gamow. Um, Beta had nothing whatsoever to, um, to do with it. That was just, that was just false. Uh, then he organized a grand parade in a room like this for, um, for uh, Alpha's doctoral, um, doctoral examination. Uh, and invited, invited 300 people, including, including the press, and arranged for the uh, Washington Post to have, um, and the New York Times, to have nice stories um, saying that um, Gamow, oh, and, and his student, um, had found that everything in the universe was made in five minutes. Fred was the real pioneer of um, um, nuclear physics. Uh, Fred didn't, didn't believe any of um, anything about Gamow's um, synthesis in, um, in the Big Bang. It all happened too fast. So Fred's contribution was that by 1946, he published a seminal paper saying that the, uh, the, the origin of the elements could be accounted for by these particle fusion processes at a temperature of three billion um, degrees in the center of red giants. Crucially, Hoyle published this paper before Gamow and Alpha published their model of nucleosynthesis. Um, needless to say, uh, Gamow had no time for, um, for Hoyle's uh, paper. <coughs> Um, because um, Gamow claimed to have already proven that uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't make the elements in an equilibrium, a slow equilibrium process, which is what, which is what Hoyle's was. So Hoyle, Bondi and Gold, um, their steady state universe, which is 1948 after Fred's nuclear synthesis paper, uh, they... Um, Gold asked the question after watching this extraordinary movie, which you can loop continuously, what if the universe is like this? And um, the three of them uh, 
and said, well, let's just work it out. Let's just do the physics. Um, uh, how would it work? And so that's how the steady state theory with the continuous creation of matter um, uh, actually, actually began. And the way in which the steady state theory could be tested against the Big Bang is very easy to understand. In a Big Bang universe, um, the objects that you observe now that are a long, long way away, you're seeing early in the life of the universe. Therefore, they will not look the same. They won't be perhaps distributed in space in the same way as the objects that are nearby. The whole point about the steady state universe is that the universe itself never evolves. Um, it just expands and new, and new matter is created in the void and the new matter then makes galaxies and so on and so forth. So no matter where you look or when you look, it always looks, it always looks the same. The acid test was going to be, um, does the universe evolve? And Martin Ryle is the person who set himself the task, as it happened, of testing this. Um, uh, he, and, um, he and his colleagues uh, began constructing radio antennae for observing initially the sun, but then for looking at radio emission generally. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the late 1940s, which I like to refer to as the heroic age of muddy field astronomy. Um, they set up their first there were Ryle and Graham Smith, two future astronomers royal. Neither of them knows any astronomy at this stage in their career. Uh, they're setting up the antenna, um, and uh, this, is a, this is a Michelson uh, in interferometer. And with an interferometer, you can get the positional information of the radio sources in the sky. Um, and so, uh, uh, Ryle began to, began to make the Cambridge um, catalogues of radio sources. Um, his first catalogue had about 50 objects. Um, the second, the second catalogue had about 120. The whole time there was this nuisance, Fred Hoyle, snapping at him and saying, well, I've got all these ideas, I can explain all of that. Um, and very nice of you to have, to have got all this um, data and dealt with horses uh, trampling your cables and so on, but I can tell you what it all means. Well, Ryle was never having any of that. Um, so the first result, the first dispute between them was when Ryle started saying he had discovered radio stars and Hoyle, the consummate nuclear astrophysicist, said they cannot, con they cannot conceivably, uh, conceivably um, be stars. Uh, and that was their first big dispute. Uh, from, his, um, from his surveys, uh, Ryle, with his radio stars, um, he remains convinced that these objects are all inside the Milky Way. Now, this isn't terribly surprising because, because two of the objects uh, were supernova remnants. Um, and uh, so certainly some of them were, but, but, not, but not the... Uh, Gold and Hoyle pressed Ryle um, to say these must be distant galaxies of a completely new kind. And um, <coughs> uh, this irritated, this irritated Ryle sufficiently um, that he was, a, he was able to get um, gold um, off the scene and, and dispatch him to the Royal Observatory and be, um, be a nuisance there. Ryle also became um, very distressed uh, in 1952 when Bader and Minkowski uh, measured the redshift of the radio galaxy Cygnus A. And as he said later, um, I realised to my dismay that we were in the, the cosmology game and uh, he, didn't really, he didn't really want to be, to be there. The big clash is to do with the counts of radio sources. Now, Ryle's first two sets of observations, there was insufficient data and they weren't correctly analysed, so it was easy for Fred Hoyle to say, 
um, you haven't proved anything. You haven't proved anything at all. Um, uh, we, we could just as well be in a steady state universe. Um, third survey is looking good, um, but Hoyle won't have any won't have any of it. Um, he, he's saying by then, well, this this man, his first two were rubbish. Why should I take this one um, seriously? So for the fourth, Ryle had a publicist. This sounds a bit like Gamow with um, Alpha's thesis. Ryle, Ryle had a publicist, set up a press conference in a room like this. Ryle's here showing all the results. Fred is sitting over there under a spotlight, staring at his shoes and wondering what's going to happen next. <coughs> he got the shock of his life when at the end Ryle says, um, and now, gentlemen, Fred Hoyle over here is going to tell all of you why I am com completely wrong. And Ryle, Ryle sat down and Hoyle <laughs> rushed out of the room. Um, so that was one of their very big, that was one of their very big clashes. Um, all of this steady state and big bang becomes uh, resolved very suddenly in 1965 with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, the relic, radi the relic, radi the relic radiation is found. Um, uh, the theorists at Princeton University immediately realize that what has been found uh, is the radiation which, um, which Alpha had predicted. However, so much time had gone by that those few people who did remember it um, thought it was Gamow who had, uh, who had um, uh, pronounced or predicted the five degree K radiation. Um, he, he, nev he, he never did any such thing. And it took, it took a long, long time for, um, for Alpha uh, to, get the, the, to get the proper credit. The proper credit didn't really happen until, until the, end of the, um, uh, the end of the 20th century. But the discovery of the background radiation <coughs> was absolutely the end for Fred Hoyle's steady state theory, although he didn't, uh, he didn't accept it very, um, very, uh, very readily. He never he never ex accepted it. He was always looking. He was always looking for something else. Um, and so, uh, one of the I, I'm, going to I'm going to give you I'm going to give you one conclusion, which is a bit different to to, to what you see elsewhere. Um, these 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 feuds uh, over um, uh, over the origin of the elements and and the nature of the universe and so on. These feuds were acted out in public, um, and it was, the, it was the first time that had happened for, um, uh, for um, astronomy. Um, both sides were maximizing their use of, of um, the media, newspapers, broadcast media, uh, and quite recently in a letter which Gamow wrote to uh, Ralph Alpha in 1955, three pages of it, um, there was a curious thing in the margin, and I turned this round, and there was a little cartoon diagram, um, and uh, Gamow is just saying to him, um, hook up yesterday with Hoyle, um, BBC, um, NBC, um, I, um, uh, I gave it to him real good and won. And that, that, is, that is the only fragment of, of evidence that we have that, uh, that, the, two, that the two of them um, publicly, publicly disagreed with something and Gamow thought he'd won. Anyway, I'll leave, it, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for a really, really interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, second from the back in the mirror, please. Uh, two questions. Um, you said that Einstein praised the mathematical elegance of Lemaitre's paper, but called it abominable physics. So if he praises the elegance of the mass, how does he justify calling it abominable physics? Um, and the, the second question was, you mentioned um, 
it was suggested that Gamov should have got the Nobel Prize for quantum tunneling only just. What did that mean? What did that mean? Oh, well, I'll, I'll answer both of those questions. Um, if, if I may, I think the I think the answer to your first question uh, perhaps um, was given elegantly in advance in the last talk. Um, in that um, I, in that Einstein had much stricter discipline um, on how to model the on how to on how to model the world than Gamow. Um, Gam, Gam, Gamow Gamow was was very much for um, being very being very uh, speculative. Sorry, uh, Lemaitre. Yeah, um, with 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 Lemaitre. Um, uh, Einstein um, uh, just didn't a just just didn't accept um, a physical model in which the entire universe um, begins from a singularity. Right. So on, on your question on your question on on Nobel prizes, um, uh, this can only be dealt with in a sense by by um, by personal opinions. Um, uh, people like um, Helga Krag, who I turn to as my go-to source, uh, because Gamow didn't settle down and work through the implications of this model, um, he simply blabbed about it to everyone and let them all go away and work out the implications. There was no, there was no follow through. Uh, in the case of um, uh, Hoyle, who did not share in the Nobel Prize for, the, um, for nuclear uh, astrophysics. Um, when, when, um, when Tony Hewish, um, uh, Jocelyn Bell and so on, the discovery of, of, of pulsars, which is a very well-known story, uh, Hoyle wrote a letter to the Times um, saying that uh, Tony Hewish had stolen his doctoral students' ideas and um, data uh, now, um, two or three days later, um, Hoyle realised that he'd made an absolutely terrible um, mistake by criticising a colleague in the academy um, in those terms and included, yeah, and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, uh, the opinion of people who were been close to Hoyle, of, wh of whom I'm one, um, is that the is that um, he just completely disqualified himself? He'd written, you know, <laughs> he'd written a letter saying he the Nobel Committee didn't know what they were doing. So I think I've answered both of your questions. Okay. okay. The, the gentleman on the right from me. With with regards to the almost Nobel Prize, in fact. Um, it was turning that whole idea around to get the alpha particles into nuclei, or rather protons into nuclei, that Cockcroft realised, and then of course the Cockcroft yes. Walton accelerator was built because of that. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gamow, Gamow realised very quickly um, that the process he was describing was um, was reversible. But but that, that w what you've just said um, very helpfully uh, is that's another example of how he didn't follow through on things. Uh, in the middle, gentlemen in the middle. And then the very back. Thanks. Um, and thank you for the talk. I, I enjoyed the spoiler alerts. Um, <laughs> you said that when uh, Ryle unveiled the results from the 3C uh, catalogues, that yes. Hoyle basically did a runner, didn't, yes. didn't respond at all. Why didn't Hoyle come back with an argument basically on, along the lines that the catalogue just doesn't sample enough of the universe? We don't know what distance these go out to. And so you can't say anything about whether the universe evolves or not. This sample's too small. Um, uh, there, was, there was one respect in which um, the, sa the sample, the third and fourth, the samples were large enough um, because the parameter that was... Um, that was uh, looked at was um, something called the log n log s um, uh, diagram, which is which, which is which is basically the um, inverse three halves. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, 
it w it, well, it wasn't showing three halves. It was showing one. It was showing one point eight. So <laughs> um, that yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. It's the log n log s diagram. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for a fascinating talk. Uh, you mentioned Gamow's colleague Alpha, did you say? Yes. Um, so Alpha computed uh, elemental distribution. Yes. Um, you know, happening at the Big Bang. Yes. And, um, and then, yeah, as I'm aware, um, Hoyle um, proposed the alternative stellar synthesis. Yes. Uh, so w what happened? But <coughs> if I saw that correctly, um, uh, Alpha's uh, distribution agreed very well with some published yes. data. So, so, so what happened with that that information? Was it was it kind of felt to be the, still uh, useful? That, um, the, uh, uh, Alpha continued to work um, on the theory and improving the theory for a for a further. Uh, for a further five years, um, but the reason why it uh, would ultimately fail is because the time period in which everything had to happen um, was less than 30 minutes from the start of the universe to the point where it's expanded sufficiently that you can't get any further nuclear reactions um, taking place. That was one difficulty. The other difficulty uh, is that, um, which was faced by, by both theories for some time, uh, not having any stable nuclei of uh, five, six, or seven. This was something called the mass gap, um, which, which uh, well, you, you've got to get through it. The way in which Hoyle got through it was he said, well, Actually, I'm not going to begin at the beginning. I know, st I know stars contain loads and loads of carbon, so I'm going to start with carbon and see what happens if alpha particles merge with carbon in the interiors of very hot stars. So he, he had a different approach altogether. Yeah. Every element. Thank you. Is there any questions? I think it's very good time for coffee and tea. Let's thank the speaker again. Okay?